Hi guys, we're gonna bring some tropical foliage into the garden today. I'll show you how to grow a banana tree from scratch. Don't worry, I'll guide you through each phase. Okay, let's start. Buddy will be my assistant today. Place your bananas to one side as we'll firstly prepare the decoction. Ah, Buddy's back, come on boy. A top hack is to store onions in a nylon stocking. This ensures freshness. Onions will rot if stored in a box or enclosed space. The best way is to make sure that air can be circulated around them. Grab a plant pot, big enough for the onions to fit into. Place the onions and excess husks into the pot. Give each onion a rub to remove the older husks. Where are you going, buddy? It's not coffee break yet. Here, boy! Put the cleaned onions to one side. These will be used later in the process. Come on to the kitchen. Place the husks into a boiling pan of water. Press down, cover, and leave to boil. Onion husks contain phytoncides. Phytoncides help to prevent fungal and bacterial diseases within plants. It's ready. Hat on and remove from the heat. Uncover and leave to cool. Whilst that's cooling, let's collect two aloe leaves. Cut off the leaves from the bottom of the plant. Aloe juice has bactericidal properties which protect plants and help to develop the strong and healthy roots. Cut off one banana from the bunch, making sure the neck of the banana is left intact. Drain the cooled onion husk broth into a glass. Put the banana into the glass, neck first. Leave to soak for 10 minutes. This allows enough time for the micro elements to be absorbed. Slice the aloe leaf into segments. Then chop and dice into smaller pieces. Place them into a holding container. Aloe really is an amazing plant. For plants and people alike. Beware though, cause it's also a natural laxative. Finally chop and dice the onions. Don't touch your eyes at this part. Scrape them into the same holding container. In they all go. and we're ready to start to prepare the soil. A useful hack when opening a bag of soil is to cut the bag crosswise. The soil will completely and easily fall away from the bag. Rub the soil through your hands to loosen any thick clumps. Add and mix everything together. This will eventually rot down and release vital nutrients, which will help the new plant grow. Pour the soil into a medium plant pot so that the young roots can feed and grow. Slice through the middle of the aloe leaf. Bend back the top layer. Remove the soaking banana. Gently rub the cut tip into the aloe juice. 
until the tip and neck are fully covered with the juice. allowing the banana to absorb a boost of nutrition. Hollow out a hole, then with the tip down, plant the banana into the pot. Secure the banana by firmly pressing the soil to seal it in place. Pour the remaining onion decoction all around the banana. Add a sprinkling of water to fully hydrate the soil. Lastly, cover the pot with a bag or cellophane to create a greenhouse effect. Ah, now you're here. Once most of the work's done, remember to keep watering, otherwise the soil will dry out. Do this for between 25 days to a month. Come on, buddy, let's see what's been happening. We've got a sprout. Remove any stray weeds. Now we need to replant into a larger pot. Soak the soil around the plant. This will make it easier to remove the plant. Plus, we don't want to damage the plant or roots. Carefully push the soil away whilst delicately pulling the plant. Use your fingers to wiggle the roots free from the soil. Time and patience is needed at this crucial replanting stage, and it's free and intact. Spray to clean off any clumps of residual soil. Do this with low pressure spray. The last thing you want to do is to damage the plant. I think we're almost done with the cleaning. Now it's time to get those hands dirty. We need to prepare the soil for a large pot. Buddy, come back. The first layer is two parts soil. Next is one part sand evenly distributed to cover the previous layer. Next layer is the finely chopped aloe, which acts as a compost. Once again, spread around so that it doesn't clump in one area. The final layers of two parts coconut substrate or coir. Coir is slow to decompose and retains the right amount of water for the plant to grow. Hollow out a hole large enough for the replanting. Carefully plant and secure by pressing the mulch in place. Making sure the roots are fully covered. Moisten the soil and remember to keep watering, as the plant has a high growth rate. Forty days have passed. Let's see what we have here. During this period, spray the leaves to keep them moist and regularly water the plant. This will make the plant feel as though it's growing in its natural habitat. Large green leaves and a thick strong stalk indicate a healthy plant. Did you know that although we call this a banana tree, it's actually a grass? That's why it grows so quickly. They can reach their full height in around nine months, reaching a height of up to six meters. Just a few cool facts for you. It's important to keep regularly watering the plant. After a period of three months, you should have your very own large banana tree. It brings a tropical feel to any garden. I seem to have done all the work throughout this video. Maybe I need a new assistant.
I just have time to squeeze in a good dad joke. Are you ready? How can you tell if you have a lazy dog? He only chases parked cars, ha <laughs> ha. Or he's called Buddy, ha <laughs> ha. Looks like Buddy heard me talking about him. Oops. Hi guys, roses will transform any garden into a fragrant oasis. Caring for them is easier than you may think. We'll look at different ways to take cuttings. Choose a healthy stem and remove excess leaves. Halfway up the stem, make a small cut. Open the gap and place a stone inside it. This is where the roots will eventually sprout. Below, place a stick. Secure it with a cable tie. This will act as a weight support system. Cut to remove the excess strap. Slice off the butt and head from a ripened banana. Leaving only the middle section. Cut the banana lengthwise. Carefully open it and wrap around the stem. Bananas contain large amounts of potassium. which helps cuttings recover from stress and to build a strong root system. Next, we need a pot, which has been cut down the side in base. With two holes at the rim of the pot, wrap the pot around the banana. Match up the holes and secure. We're almost ready to fill in with soil. But I don't know about you, but I'm always misplacing tools. So here's a hack to make a trowel. Carefully slice through the middle of a water bottle. At the cut end of the top part, carve out a horseshoe shape. Take your time, we don't want any accidents. And here we have it. Here comes another juicy fact about roses. All rose petals are edible. Amazing! Fill and compact the soil. This is too much weight for the stem to hold. So drive a cane into the large pot. Connect the stem to the cane by using cable ties. This will keep the stem from taking on any undue pressure and weight. Although roses have modest water needs and can withstand long periods of drought, make sure they are watered at regular intervals. After around 25 days, it's time to check on its progress. Rose cuttings can be taken at any point throughout the year. But only take cuttings from healthy, well-watered plants.
Now the moment of truth. Cut the branch from under the secured pot. Hold the pot and remove the ties securing it to the cane. Now it's free from the original rose plant. Cut away the cable ties from the pot. Gently pull apart. Whilst holding the stem firmly with one hand. Remove the pot. Carefully brush away the surplus soil. The decomposed banana skin needs to be removed. Gently pull the skin and cable ties downwards over the root system. During this period, the roots have absorbed the banana's nutrients and minerals. Treat the roots with the utmost care so as to minimize trauma. Finally, spray with a pollinator. Fun fact, although roses carry pollen, the particles are too big to be airborne. So they're allergy friendly. Okay, now remove the stone. Cut off part of the branch under the roots. And sadly, the flowering bloom. So that all the energy and nutrients are directed into the root system. Transplant the stem into a larger pot with prepared soil. Press down to ensure the stem is secure. Water abundantly. Leave the plant in the open air to germinate further. Don't replant it for several years, allowing it to adapt to its new habitat. Let's revive a wilted rose. Soak the stem in honey. We all know honey is healthy, but it's also a natural antiseptic. It's a great rooting stimulant for cuttings. And also protects against fungal infections. Roses are one of the oldest known flowers. With fossils found from 35 million years ago. Let's take a look at how to use aloe with cuttings. Aloe has bactericidal properties that protects plants. Remove the tip off an aloe leaf. Then cut a piece around three centimeters long. Insert the stem into the cut aloe piece. Place in water and leave. After 25 days, the initial roots have grown. It's ready to be planted. Energetic young cuttings can produce flowers in their first year. Now for something different. This time, we'll use honey for the roots. Make a hole in a potato and push the stem in. Place in a pot and cover with soil. Potatoes have a high water content. This keeps the cutting moist whilst the roots develop. Cut the stem midway. After a couple of weeks, the root system's formed. This time, we'll use a rose stem as a holder for the cuttings. 
slice across a thick stem. On an angle, shave the bottom part of a cutting. Push the cutting into the stem and secure with tree grafting tape. Three to four weeks later, roots will form. Let's take one more look at using aloe. Cut a midsection from an aloe leaf. Push the stem inside. Remove the bloom. Remember to always water at regular intervals. Hope this has given you the confidence and know-how. Try take a cutting today. See you all soon. Hi guys, today we will rejuvenate a tired orchid. Orchids are considered a tropical plant, but they grow on every continent except Antarctica. The plant has finished blooming and its flowers are wilting. We will rejuvenate this one before its next bloom. Use cleaner, better sterilized pruners to avoid spreading diseases. Cut the branch close to a swollen bud below the lowest flower bloom. Next, melt candle wax all over the cut. This will seal the cut to prevent rotting. Now let's prepare a banana to provide vitamins and minerals to the branch. Peel the banana. We only need the peel. Next, cut the peel into small pieces. Potassium in banana peel stimulates flowering. Now let's cover the orchid buds with the pieces of peel. Use a binder clip or hair claw clip to secure it. Do it in the morning, as the peel should be removed after six hours. Repeat this procedure once a week until the buds have grown up. Nothing's wasted in my garden. Place our remaining banana peel pieces into a blender. Add around one liter of water and mix. Pour the infusion into a jar, seal and leave in a cool, dark place. After one day, the nutrients will be in the water. Next, strain the solution. This supplies plants with potassium for immunity to stress and pests. Dilute the solution with one liter of water. Now we have a liquid fertilizer. It will support healthy bacteria in the soil. It's environmentally friendly and cost efficient. Use it every two to three weeks on all orchids.
Now that our buds have grown up, don't wrap them with peel. Only continue to use the liquid fertilizer. Did you know that there are more orchids on the planet than there are mammals and birds? Also, if you have allergies, it's good to know that orchids are hypoallergenic. Let's move on and have a look at some different hacks. Snake plants are one of the easiest cuttings to propagate. Insert each cutting into hole drilled cork and place in a bed of soil. Or propagate using potatoes. They give antibacterial water supply and nutrients. An alternative is hydroponic sponge or foam. You can monitor the progress of the plant's growth. Here are some natural fertilizers for house plants to help your indoor plants thrive. Due to the addition of potassium, nitrogen, and calcium, Now let's graft two different species of cacti to form a single plant. Once attached, they will have a unique appearance. No seedling pots. Let's make a DIY seedling holder. Fill with soil, sprinkle the seeds, water, and watch them sprout. Here we have dragon fruit with lots of seeds. Fresh undried seeds usually germinate within a few days. Add peanut shells to provide nutrients. Did you know that you can compost your egg cartons? If they're made of cardboard, but break them up first. Next, let's take a rose cutting to root using styrofoam. Foam absorbs water and keeps the cutting hydrated while the roots form. Now let's boost ginger root growth by using cut onions. Onions are a natural root stimulant. During the life of a plant, stems get damaged. This can be fixed using a splint method. Wrap card around the damaged stem, then clip to a healthy stem. This is a hack to create a foam hydroponic tray. Heat up a quarter and drop it into the foam to make cylindrical holes. Perfect for holding plants in place during rooting. Introduce a compost bin with worms into the planting area. Worms excrete material that the growing plants use as nutrients. It's a natural way to turn veggie waste into fertilizer. 
Toilet roll tubes are always a plenty. Use them as seed planters. Once the seeds have sprouted, plant the tube into the soil. It naturally biodegrades. Another broken stem. Let's fix this. Before putting a splint, add powdered cinnamon over the break. Cinnamon has antifungal and antibacterial properties. Lastly, aloe vera helps cuttings establish new roots. Until next time, happy gardening! Oh, hi guys. Today we're going to make a polishing tool to be an attachment for an angle grinder. Choose a couple of sturdy cardboard sheets. Using a disc as a template. Draw around the outer edges and the inner hole. Repeat this process until you have seven to eight copies. This is a great way to recycle unwanted cardboard. It's easier to handle smaller pieces during the cutting stage to reduce unnecessary bending of the cardboard. Try to keep the cutouts as flat as possible. Only cut the outer circle. We'll remove the inner circle shortly. Bends can be removed by hitting each cut out with a rubber hammer. Don't use a metal hammer as this will cause further indentations. Polishing tools are readily available to buy, but they aren't as powerful as an angle grinder. Due to the grinder producing much more torque, moving on, apply strong multi surface glue to one side of the cutout. Make sure the whole surface is covered. Line up the edges, then stick and stack them. Apply pressure by pressing down to ensure they create a tight bond. Making sure that they align. A good tip is to place a flat, heavy weight on top of the stack. Leave in situ for a couple of hours to ensure the glue is bonded and dried. Place metal discs above and below the stack. Do a quick check to make sure that the inner holes line up with the discs. As a safety reminder, uh, make sure the bench vise is securely fitted to the bench. Drill through the inner hole. Did you know the vise is known as the third hand? As it's an indispensable tool in any workshop. Now the moment of truth. Place the pad onto the angle grinder and tighten the locking nut. A pointer to remember is when using an angle grinder. Stop at regular intervals to rest your hands and arms.
Once we have sanded down the whole outer rim, switch off and check by rubbing your finger along the edge. Use polishing paste for a smoother finish. It will help to remove the most stubborn of stains. It's used with polishers, rinsing machines, and engraving tools too. Our first task is to use the pad to sharpen a knife. Loss of sharpness is a natural cycle. So sooner or later, every sharp blade will become blunt. With the angle grinder in motion, hold the knife flat and firm onto the rotating pad. I move the edge of the blade at a slight angle back and forth. Amazingly, you're more likely to cut yourself with a blunt knife than a sharp one, because a blunt knife requires more pressure and can slip easier. Oh dear, time to give the sole plate a clean, I think. Over time, most household irons develop burn and sticky marks. Proceed to polish the sole plate using the edge of our new disc. Even with infrequent usage, this part should be cleaned twice a year. As it will not only prolong its lifespan, but also its performance. Stubborn stains will take longer to remove. Spray distilled water, then wipe with a cloth to remove any residue. Because we're using compressed cardboard, we'll avoid scratching or scouring the sole plate. The jets are spraying. Mission accomplished. Now we're going to use our pad to remove carbon burn from the base of a pan. Overheating, cooking acidic foods, or allowing the pan to boil dry can cause discoloration and carbon residue forming. We repeat the same process as previously, polishing the whole surface of the base. After wiping, you'll bring new life back to the pan. And now we'll just make our own street shower. Start with supplies like a PVC pipe, 32 millimeters, and something to cut the pipes with. Now let's cut the pipe into three pieces. And keep some pipe tees handy. Take a pipe and add a wooden stopper inside. Hammer it in to keep it from falling out. Pour some sand in through the other end. Hammer in a wooden cork or plug. Now we'll see how you bend the pipe. We'll need a round wooden base to get it into shape. Add a clamp to help keep it in place. You're going to need to wear gloves for this next part. We're going to use a hot gun to heat up the pipe. This hot gun should be at 650 degrees Celsius. The heat will help the pipe's elasticity. Shape the pipe by pressing it against the wooden circle. Just watch as the pipe gets a nice arch shape. Remove the sand once you're done bending. Now it's time to make sure the pipes fit into the fitting. Cut the pipe down to the size you need. Add the pipe and tee to different sides of this iron. One goes in, one goes on. Now it's made to fit. 
Remember, keep your gloves on during this. We're dealing with high temperatures after all. Now secure the pipe into the T's. Remember, heating the fitting and pipe together. Isn't just to save time, but to secure a good fit. Now this tee should fit. Heat for 8 seconds and weld for seconds. Now let's clamp the pipes to the table. Take a soldering iron and make some holes. Don't inhale any fumes. And don't forget to let the plastic cool down. Make a pattern of holes along the pipe. We can take a break from the technical side. And give these pipes a nice coat of paint. Lay down some cardboard to start spraying. We're going with orange, but you can pick any color you want. Give it around 30 minutes to dry before handling it. Good, it's dry. Let's attach it outside. It can go anywhere as long as it gets water. Now enjoy your backyard shower. It should feel great during the summer. Close your eyes and it's like your very own waterfall. Just don't forget to bring soap. Or shampoo, either. Now let's make a shower head for the backyard faucet. Take a 25 millimeters PVC pipe, a funnel, and some sand. Once again, the sand will keep the pipe from denting. Add some tape to keep the sand in place. Warm up the pipe with a hot gun at 650 degrees Celsius. Use something round to shape it into place. Add a plastic plug with soldering holes. Turn the water on when you need a quick rinse. Just turn off the valve when you're ready to dry off. Okay, today we're going to fix this broken leg by using a plastic bottle. Reusing materials is a great way to save costs and to reduce waste. Remove the top and bottom parts of the bottle. We will be using the middle section for this hack. Match the broken piece up to the leg. Then slide the plastic segment over the brake, making sure that the plastic overlaps the brake. Position the flame from the mini blow torch above the plastic and proceed to melt the whole area until it bonds to the leg. Once cooled, the plastic seals the break and strengthens the leg. Perfect. Working in the garden can be a messy job. So instead of walking into the house with dirty hands, we're going to make an outside water tap. By using a water bottle to harvest rainwater, after removing the tip of a syringe. Place it in the middle of the bottle top. Then outline the circumference of the syringe. Proceed to melt the plastic outline with a soldering iron 
Be careful as soldering irons can heat up to 896 degree Fahrenheit, which is extremely hot. After placing the syringe through the bottle top hole, apply glue around the new cut. Then push the bottle top up to the outer lip of the syringe so that the glue bonds the two pieces together. Next, we need to solder small holes into the tube of the syringe. Don't forget to replace the plunger. Cut away the bottom part of the plastic bottle. Then solder two holes directly opposite one another. For stringing and hanging up, after screwing in the bottle top section, hang the water tap from a sturdy pole or branch. Using rainwater can help to reduce water bills and provide an alternative supply during water restrictions. Next, I'll show you a great and expensive way to bring plants into the house. Without spending money on buying vases, Cut around a bottle, about a third of the way down. Then cut and remove the base. Place the bottle cap onto the upturned base and mark out the area. Next, solder holes tightly next to one another around the mark. This will help to separate the plastic easier. Now we can place the neck of the bottle inside the hole and replace the cap. We're at the painting stage. For convenience, use a spray paint specifically meant for plastics. If you use a regular spray paint, you'll have to either firstly add a primer paint or sand the bottle. Otherwise, the paint will simply run off the plastic. Once the paint has dried, we're ready to replant. Did you know that 90% of the cost of bottled water is actually the bottle itself? So by reusing bottles, you're not only getting more value for money, but also decreasing waste production, especially since almost 80% of plastic ends up in the landfill. Plastic bottle usage in the garden has many advantages. Clay and ceramic pots can break easily, whereas pots from plastic are stronger and more durable. Plus, the non-porous walls reduce airflow in and out of the root zone, keeping the potting soil wetter. My next hack is a great space-saving idea. We're going to create a planting holder for onion bulbs. After cutting away the base, solder holes about the size of a penny around the area of the bottle. Then fill with soil and compost. Firmly press an onion bulb, root first into each hole. An amazing fact about onions is whether you eat them cooked or raw, they retain the same nutritive value. And if, like me, you eat them raw, onion breath can be freshened by chewing on parsley or mint leaves. Time for a hand wash. Pull the plunger down to release the water.
not forgetting to push it back up when you've finished. Onions grow quickly and from bulbs they're ready to harvest after 90 days. Ours are still in the growing stage, but coming along nicely. Remember to water at regular intervals. A good way to ensure each plant receives enough water is to overturn a half-filled bottle and place over the plant. No water can? No problem. Pierce holes into the base of a half-cut bottle. Then about two centimeters from the top, solder two large holes opposite one another. Push your pole through the holes as a carry handle. Now you can reach those further away plants. Our next hack is to make a fruit grabber. For those fruits hanging just out of reach. This mechanism will grab and collect fruit. Let's give it a try. A bit of a tug and here we have it. Plastic bottles can also be reutilized as kitchen tools. Firstly, solder small holes into the base of a bottle. Then cut the bottle in half. And here we have it, a handy water strainer. Plastic bottles are extremely versatile, not only for usage around the house and garden, but for art and craft ideas too. Talking of which, let's complete my hanging mobile. After hole punching two holes opposite one another, thread with nylon wire and tie the two ends together. Secure the knot into the cap of a previous hanging bottle. Fill each individual bottle with water and plants. You now have a hanging mobile garden. We'll now look at making a small handheld, lighter watering can. Happy hacks, see you soon. A broken hacksaw? No problem. I'll show you a hack to solve this issue. We need two pieces of PVC pipe and two PVC elbow bends. Using a pipe welding machine, weld an elbow to either end of the length of plastic. The hot melt from the pipe welder plays a vital role in connecting pipes and fittings. Next, we'll make the support shafts to hold the hack saw blade. Using pipe cutters, cut two lengths of pipe each about 10 centimeters long. Then heat and weld each small length to the elbows. This will become our hacksaw frame. Our next step is to prepare the pipes to securely hold the blade. Saw around one to two centimeter deep through both open ends of the pipe, ensuring that they are directly opposite one another. Then drill a hole on both sides of the frame so that they go through the front and back of each cut. Slot the blade into the cuts, 
and attach the bolts and wing nuts. Make sure to tighten securely. And now we have a fully operational hacksaw. Let's give it a try. Hacksaws were originally made for cutting metal, but are ideal for cutting through plastic. On a bright and colorful note, we're going to make an LED illuminated speaker. Using a heat gun helps make the plastic more pliable which allows you to use various items to stretch the pipe into shape. Next, we need to prepare the lid of the speaker. So cut and heat a semicircle piece of drainage pipe. Then place it in a press to straighten. Afterwards, we need to mark out and sand off the excess plastic. Here's a quick fact for you. We know LEDs have a long lifespan, but did you know that if an LED bulb was turned on and not turned off, it would take over three years to burn out? Amazing! Okay, so once we've smoothed the edges, we're ready to mark out for the power switches. The easiest way is to solder around the markouts and remove. I'll be placing three speakers into this lamp. So after drilling the holes, sand them down to remove any sharp and excess plastic. When attaching the smaller piece with three holes inserted, make sure the holes line up with one another, as these will be used to screw and secure the dials in place. Once you've drilled three holes out of a piece of white PVC, sand each hole for a smooth finish. One of the wonderful things about using PVC for crafting in hacks is that PVC pipes are inexpensive, readily available, and easy to work with. It's a material that you can cut, paint, drill, and glue. If you want a quicker bond, spray activator over the glue. Once again, sand around the perimeter to remove the surplus plastic. Before spraying with paint, affix masking tape around the top lip of the lamp because this will be where the LED lights will shine through. Choose your own particular color, but remember to use a paint specifically for plastics. I'm going for an edgy modeled effect. Simply spray a different paint color onto a rag and dab around the area to give a marbled effect. A great plus in using an LED strip is that LED strips use around 80% less energy than halogen bulbs. They can also be conveniently and easily fixed anywhere But before we affix the strip to our speaker, we need to remove the masking tape from the lip of the speaker. We can now affix the speakers and dials.
Carefully curl and place the LED multicolored strip inside the lamp. We're now ready to turn the dial. Make a sound and here we have it. A noise activated LED speaker, color coordinated to your own taste. Thank you guys, take care and see y'all soon.